Welcome back, everybody, to another week of Sunday School here at the Lighthouse Church of the Nazarene in Moravia, Iowa, where we are going through the book of Job. This week, we are in Job chapter 8. So we're about 20% of the way through the book of Job. Now, what have we learned so far from the book of Job? Um, we actually haven't learned anything yet about why suffering takes place or how suffering can be any good for us. Those are the things we hope to learn out of the book of Job. Um, but we have learned a few things. We've learned this. We've learned bad things happen to good people. Job was a righteous man. Um, God commended him. He was like, Job, he's my best servant. Have you considered him? So we have learned that out of the book of Job. Bad things do happen to good people. Uh, what else have we learned from the book of Job? We learned that we do have an enemy of our soul. And his name's Satan. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8 that uh, our adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So we've learned from the book of Job that bad things happen to good people, that we have an enemy of our soul. But we've also learned this, that enemy of our soul, Satan, he's on a leash. He can only do what God allows him to do, and he can do no more. So why he allows him to do as much as he does, I don't know the answer to that. But we do learn that he can only do so much. He's on a leash. God said, you can do this to Job, but no more. So what else have we learned from the book of Job? We've learned that uh, trials in our life constrain a good marriage. Job had a wonderful family, and it uh, seemed like they all got along and loved each other, so we can assume that Job and his wife had a great marriage. But after Job goes through all this, what does Job's wife tell him? Curse God and die. And Job says to her, no, you're talking like one of those foolish women. Can we, do, can, we can't do that. Can we accept good from God and not bad? So we've learned all those things so far from the book of Job. What else? Uh, we learn how not to comfort hurting people. Uh, Job's three friends, they start out great, but then what do they do? They start trying to preach a sermon at Job. Hurting people do not need a sermon preached at for them. They just need us to be there for them and to comfort them and console them and to listen. That's how we can help hurting people. And last of all, what have we learned so far from the book of Job? That there are things going on in the heavenly realms that we have no idea. Job had no idea about what was going on between that conversation that was going on between God and Satan. Uh, what does the Apostle Paul tells us? He tells us we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness, against spiritual hosts in the heavenly places. There are things going on in the heavenly realms that we have no idea about. So, like I said, we're in the book of Job, chapter 8. Quick outline to catch us up to here. In chapters 1 and 2, that's when all the bad stuff happens to Job. And Job's three friends show up and they sit for seven days. Uh, chapter 3, Job speaks. Why does this happen to me? Chapters 4 and 5, his friend Eliphaz speaks. Chapter 6 and 7, Job speaks again. And then here we are in chapter 8. We're going to hear from a new guy today. And he's named Bildad the Shuhite. So, um, so Bildad the Shuhite, what do we know about him? He gives, He's actually going to give three speeches in the book of Job. Most likely, he's a descendant of Abraham and Abraham's second wife, Keturah. You'll find them in Genesis chapter 25. They had a son named Shua. So Bildad the Shuite is probably a descendant of uh, Abraham and Keturah. He's probably middle in age between Eliphaz and Zophar, and that's why he's speaking second. But that's, we're just kind of assuming that here. So we're going to hear from Bildad the Shuhite, Job chapter 8. Let's get out our Bibles and let's follow along. Job chapter 8, verse 1. Then Bildad the Shuhite answered and said, how long will you speak these things and the words of your mouth be like a strong wind? Bildad pretty much just referred to Job as a windbag right here. What's a windbag? Somebody who talks at length about nothing and his words have no substance. We've all heard that phrase. Well, that person, they're pretty windy. We've heard that phrase before. That's what Bildad just referred to Job as. Now, Bildad's starting out great, is he not? Uh, do you remember when I told you about Eliphaz? And Eliphaz is trying to do the whole cause and effect thing with Job and saying, Job, you've obviously sinned. The bad part is Eliphaz was the most compassionate of the three friends. Bildad just starts out direct, no courtesy or anything, just says, hey, how long are you going to be so windy like this? Verse 3. Does God subvert judgment or does the Almighty pervert justice? Well, of course the answer to that's no, that's a rhetorical question. Genesis 18 25 says, Does not the God of all the earth, will the God of will the God of the earth not do what's right? Of course he's always going to do what's right, no matter what he does. So verse 4. 
Now this is, listen to this. This is what Bill Dad tells Job. If your sons have sinned against him, him being God, he has cast them away for their transgressions. What did Bildad just tell Job here? Bildad just told Job that his children died because they were horrible sinners and they deserved to die. This is where we can all get into trouble by making assumptions. Bildad just assumes that Job's children were bad children. Um, you and I can do the same thing though, can we not? A lot of times when we read the book of Job, we try to um, insert ourselves into Job like, oh yeah, I can relate to Job. But most likely, a lot of the times we can be like the, the three friends and make judgment calls. Think about it, when you see somebody, say, pull into a handicapped spot and then they get out and it seems like they're walking fine. You're like, oh, those people are just lazy. Or, or if somebody's unemployed, you think, oh, they, they, they could get a job if they wanted to. Or if you see somebody's kids misbehaving, you, you just think... Those are bad parents right there. All these things. We all make these judgments calls. And we we never have the full story. Bill Dad doesn't have the full story. We never have the full story either. Even the Apostle Paul tells us that we don't even have the full story on ourselves. It's in 1 Corinthians 13. Paul says, now I know in part, but soon I will know just as I also am known. He's saying, when I die and I stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, that's when I'll have the full picture. That's when how that is when I will be known as I am known. Because after all, there's only one that has the complete picture, and who's that? God. God knows the entire story. God knows our hearts. Um, it's interesting. Remember when the the Israelites were wanting to pick a king to replace Saul, and they saw all of David's brothers, like, oh, this must be the one. And it's in 1 Samuel 16, 7, where Samuel says, Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. So all that. All right. One more thing I want to talk about here. And it's dealing with Job's children. Remember clear back in the first chapter when Job would make sacrifices for his children just in case they had sinned. That tells us that the events of this book take place before the establishment of the Levitical priesthood. Because uh, once the establishment of the Levitical priesthood was put into order, you know, Moses and Aaron, Nobody would have dared make a sacrifice except for the priest. In fact, that's what got Saul in trouble, and that's how Saul lost the kingdom, actually. So, tells us kind of when the book was, was written. Let's keep going here. Verse 5. If you would earnestly seek God and make supplication to the Almighty, if you were pure and upright, surely now he would awake for you and prosper your, prosper your rightful dwelling place. Here's another bad assumption made by Bildad. Bildad says, Job, if you were pure and upright. he's What is he saying? He say, Job, you're obviously not pure and upright. Because if you were pure and upright, everything would be going great for you. So obviously, Job, you are not pure and upright. Now, this is actually direct contradiction to what God said. Because three times, um, once right off the bat in the book of Job, and then two times God said it to Satan. Three times God has said Job was pure and upright. So this is a huge, Bildad is a, saying a contradicting statement to what God has actually said. This is why it is so important for us to not judge. Uh, what did Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? Matthew chapter 7. Judge not that you be not judged. For with judgment you use, it will be measured back to you. The um, book of James says the same thing. It says, uh, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge one another? So we really have to make sure that we're not judging. Uh, Jesus said it. Uh, he's, what did he say? He said, uh, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Uh, there's an interesting story. It's about Charles Spurgeon and his wife. Charles Spurgeon great preacher. He was selling eggs and he never gave any away, even to his own family members. He always took money in for these eggs and people accused him of being greedy and money hungry. Well, it turned out after he died, they figured out that with this egg money that they were supporting widows with it. And they were taking it to heart that said, you know, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Do not do your charitable deeds before men. So people were making a judgment call about Charles Spurgeon when they didn't have the entire story at all. So build that here. He's assuming to know something that only God can know. Job, if you were pure and upright. So Job is obviously wrong here, but let's keep going here. Verse seven. This is Bildad speaking throughout the whole chapter. Verse seven, though your beginning was small, yet your latter end will increase abundantly. Now this does actually happen to Job. If you go to the very end of the book of Job, chapter 42, 
He actually doubles all his livestock and he gets another 10 children back. Now, is this a promise for all of us that at the end of our lives, we're going to be richly blessed with everything? Well, no, but there is a spiritual blessing to this. Um, I can guarantee you our ending will be much greater than our beginning because it's something called heaven, a place where all believers in Jesus Christ will end up. It's a place where the Apostle Paul says, uh, I has not seen nor ear heard nor has ever entered into the heart of men, the things that which God has prepared for those who love him. So our endings will be so much better than our beginnings. So it is true. So let's keep going here. Verse eight, for inquire please of the former age and consider the things discovered by their fathers. For we were born yesterday and know nothing because our days on earth are a shadow. Will they not teach you and tell you and utter words from their hearts? What's Bildad saying? Job, we need to learn from the former things. Seek the wisdom from the olden days. Those people know know everything. Our life is too short to learn it all. Now, this actually is good advice. It, it's being wrongly applied by Bildad, accusing Job of stuff, but this is good advice. Uh, it's so much easier to learn from the mistakes of others and to build off what others have learned already. If each generation had to reinvent the wheel, we would never get anywhere. Life's too brief for us to learn everything on our own, so we have to learn from the wisdom of the past. Let's keep going here. Verse 11, can the papyrus grow up without a marsh? Can reeds flourish without water? While it is yet green and not cut down, it withers away before any other plant. Verse 13, so are the paths of all who forget God, and the hope of the hypocrite shall perish. Bildad is now going back to cause and effect. The same thing that Eliphaz did. He's saying the, the papyrus can't grow up without a marsh. Reeds can't flourish without water. Men don't lose all their health and wealth and have boils on their skin unless there's a reason, Job. And the hypocrite will, be, will perish just in the same way. So Bildad is going back to cause and effect. The interesting thing, Jesus actually talked about this. I got to turn here real quick. And it's Luke chapter 13. This is Luke chapter 13, verse 1. This is Jesus. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think that they were worse sinners than all the other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Jesus goes into the same cause and effect. Do you, do you think that the Galileans whose blood Pilate mixed with others were bad sinners? No, no. It Stuff just happens in life. So that's where we can go with this. Let's keep going here. Where are we at here? Verse 14. Bildad's talking about the hypocrite. Verse 14. Whose confidence shall be cut off and whose trust is a spider's web. He leans on his house, but it does not stand. He holds it fast, but it does not endure. He grows green in the sun and his branches spread out in the garden. His roots wrap around the rock heap and look for a place in the stone. If he is destroyed from his place, then it will deny him saying, I have not seen you. Bildad's telling him, your foundation is as a spider web. Whatever it is, it's as a spider web. Think how quickly a spider web can be torn down. No matter how intricate and beautiful it is, it, it can disappear like that. We have to ask ourselves, what's our foundation resting on? And if it's anything other than Jesus Christ, it's shaky ground. Uh, let's see, what did Jesus say? In the Sermon on the Mount again, he said, Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rocks. And the rains descended and the floods came and the wind blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall because its foundation was on the rock. But he who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, Jesus says, I will liken him to a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. So we have to ask ourselves, what's our foundation resting on? Um, Jesus Christ is the only eternal thing. If we're putting our trust in uh, any sort of assets, job, how many people find their identity in their job? Something that can be gone tomorrow, their money. If our foundation is in anything else except Jesus Christ, because he's the only the only eternal one, when this life comes to pass, only the things done for the Lord will last. We have to know what our foundation's on. So verse 19, and we're almost done here. Behold, 
This is the joy of his way, and out of the earth others will grow. Behold, God will not cast away the blameless, nor will he uphold the evildoers. He will yet fill your mouth with laughing and your lips with rejoicing. Those who hate you will be clothed with shame and the dwelling place of the wicked will come to nothing. Do you know what's interesting? What did he say here? Those will, they, God will not cast away the blameless. The dwelling place of the wicked will come to nothing. Those who hate you will be clothed with shame. Do you know who is going to be brought to shame? Job's three friends. At the end of the book, God's going to say, I condemn you because you did not speak what was right. And Job's actually going to have to pray for these three friends. Now, if Job can pray for these three friends, we can surely pray for our enemies, just like God told us to. So we're done with Bildad speaking. Next week, Job's going to speak. One more thing I wanted to talk about with Bildad here. I'm sure it was easy for Bildad to kind of pile on with what Eliphaz was saying and just kind of jump on the bad wagon because Eliphaz was already doing it. It's so easy for us to just join the crowd and uh, it's so hard to separate ourselves out from the crowd and do something else. How hard could it have been for Eliphaz to make this speech and then Bildad say, you know what, we, we don't know what we're talking about. Nobody knows anything. So next week, we're going to hear from Job again. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something and I'll see you the same time, same place next week. Bye.